Hello everybody. Hello YouTube. Hello art history enthusiasts and visual culture aficionados. It's me again, Miss M. And I'm back with yet another video. This time I am going to be again announcing something introducing something i don't even know what to call it anymore i know that i'm behind i know that i should be putting out another shining analysis video and i'm gonna just give me a little time i know that i need to get started with my um kill bill videos i will just give me a little time it's hot it's hot it's hot it's hot i know i want to do some true uh art crime videos too <laughs> i want to do so much but this past couple of months ooh, i've been busy i've been busy um and i just don't have the time or the energy to do like these really kind of involved videos that i that i was doing before but i will i will get back on the horse and i will um you know get going uh, what am I going to do today? First, let me get the church announcements out the way. If you like the video, please do consider hitting the like button, um, uh, commenting and subscribing and or sharing the video. If you know somebody who might enjoy this nonsense. Uh, and again, if you don't like the video, go ahead and hit that dislike button. I want to see. I want to see a dislike. I want to see it. A thumbs down. Let's go. But anyway, <clears throat> so that's that. I think that's that's it for the church announcements. I'm not doing an affiliate marketing uh, link today. I just can't be bothered. <laughs> I just wanted to put a video out and I'm announcing, like I said, I'm going to be doing videos, analysis, or just talk videos. You know me. If you're if you're one of my 71 subscribers, um, you already know that I like to talk. You already know that I, I can talk for a while, for sometimes two hours, more or less two hours straight. So here we are. And what do I want to do today? I want to talk about this freaking movie, Full Metal Jacket. And I don't know how many videos I'm going to do about this movie, um, but I'm going to do it because... I just want to. I need to do this movie. I need to talk about this movie. There is something going on with this movie that, you know, it's another Stanley. It's another Kubrick movie. So I've already, I'm all, I'll, bleh. I'm already doing, um, The Shining and I'm gonna start doing Full Metal Jacket and the trailer is playing on the Internet Movie Database, um, website. So that's not me. That's them. All right. So, uh, <sighs> This is it, right? And it's, and this is the poster, I guess, for the, for the movie. In Vietnam, the wind doesn't blow, it sucks. Uh, Stanley Kubrick's full metal jacket. And it's got the helmet. Um, Joker's. Private Joe. Here he is. Matthew Modine's character. A private Joker. Uh, his helmet, uh, born to kill with the peace sign. All right. Um, and I'm a big fan of this movie. I really, really like this movie. I don't know why I like it. Probably because in my, in, in deep down in my soul, I know that, um, Stanley Kubrick was doing something here. You know? Just like with The Shining. Just like with all of his other movies. He was trying to do something. What was he trying to do? I'm not entirely sure. So, you know, I've been trying in my own little, my own pathetic little way to analyze The Shining. And I've tried to do The Exorcist. And I'm going to try and do Kill Bill. I'm going to try and do Phil Metal Jacket. Eventually, when I, when I work up the courage, I'm going to finally watch Hereditary and try to figure that one out. Um, something's going on in this movie. Full Metal Jacket. Something is being said. He's doing something. I think it's maybe even similar to what he's doing in The Shining. I think he's got a certain similarity with all of his movies. Um, he's trying to... 
I don't know. I I I don't know if I I, I even want to venture a guess as to what he's doing or what he's really doing or really trying to do. Um, one thing that Full Metal Jacket and The Shining seem to have in common for me, as in my opinion, please don't come for me, um, but in my opinion, what I think both of those movies are trying to do is you're supposed to be questioning the narrator. All right. And who is the narrator in The Shining? <sighs> hard to tell, isn't it? Really hard to tell. In this one, in Full Metal Jacket, it's very obvious who's the narrator. This dude. Ah, we don't even get a picture. Oh, there he is. Private James T. Joker Davis. So now you know his name. In the movie, you, you, you could be excused for not catching his name because they don't really throw it very, very hard at you. Um... This is James Davis, better known as Private Joker, is the main character of Full Metal Jacket by Stanley Kubrick. He is played by Matthew Modine. Okie dokie. All right. Uh, so, is he reliable? That's the question I'm going to try and answer as I do my videos for Full Metal Jacket. Is So, Private Joker is the one telling the story. Should we trust him? Is, is, does he know what he's talking about? Is he just full of shit? Is that what's going on? And again, very, I think very similar to The Shining. Who's the narrator in The Shining? I don't know. I don't know. I can't, I, I you know how many times I've watched The Shining? both alone and with company, with people, with friends, and even in a professional setting. Like, I try to um, teach that movie, and I still don't know what's going on. I, I mean, I have a kind of a hint or a clue, but I'm not sure. And I think anybody who says that they know what's going on or that they can, you know, try to figure out what's going on in either The Shining or Full Metal Jacket or whatever, any Stanley Kubrick movie, I think... I think they they shouldn't be taken very seriously. If somebody says that they know for sure 100% what's going on in these movies and that's it and that's that, that's that and that's all and no, mm -mm, no you don't. You don't know anything. You you can't know. You can't know. It's not about knowing. Anyway, so here we go. This I'm going to put these links in the description for the IMDb page. A pragmatic really a pr pragmatic, okay, whatever, I guess they never saw the movie. Uh, a pragmatic U.S. Marine observes the dehumanizing effects the Vietnam War has on his fellow recruits from their brutal boot camp training to the bloody street fighting in Hue. Okay, sure. And now, you, of course, this is the beauty of IMDb. You can scroll down and you can see all of the... Um, actors who played all of the different roles you know these people are famous maybe they're not household names but they're famous right this this is a pretty awesome movie i love it i don't know why and of course i'm going to leave you uh the wikipedia article for full metal jacket a 1987 war drama film directed and produced by stanley kubrick who also co-wrote the screenplay with Michael Herr and Gustav Hasford. Gustav Hasford was the uh, author of the novel that Full Metal Jacket is based on. Okay, the f and that it goes on to say just that the film is based on Hasford's 1979 novel, The Short Timers, and stars Matthew Modine. And like you just saw a picture of Hasford. Okay, let me. I I'm gonna give you his Wikipedia too. Look at him. Right, just look at him. Um, now you know why he cast Matthew Modine, or whoever cast Matthew Modine, why they cast Matthew Modine, because Matthew Modine's, especially the lower half of Modine's face, very closely mimics this here. That's at least how I feel. I don't know, I could be wrong. But here we go. Um, yeah, it's based on the novel The Short Timers and stars Matthew Modine, Lee Ermey, Vincent D'Onofrio, and Adam Baldwin. Okay. 
Uh, the storyline follows a platoon of U.S. Marines through their boot camp training in Marine Corps Recruit Depot, Paris Island, South Carolina, primarily focusing in the first half of the film on Privates J.T. Davis and Leonard Lawrence, nicknamed Joker and Pyle, who struggle under their abusive drill instructor, Gunnery Sergeant Hartman. The second half portrays the experiences of Joker and one other of the platoon's Marines in Vietnamese cities Da Nang and Hue during the Tet Offensive of the Vietnam War. The film's title refers to the full metal jacket bullet used by military servicemen. Okay, cool. Uh, Warner Brothers released. Okay, I don't really care about that information. The plot. You can read this in your own time. You really can. Um, know this. For, for, you know, this is enough, I think, for right now. But know this. The plot of the movie differs from the f plot of the book written by Gustav Hasford. All right? There's... It, it's it's just different. It's just different. Um, during the Vietnam War, a group of recruits... Okay, Paris Island, we know that. Gomer Pyle, J.T. Davis, Joker... Uh, piles, ineptitude, yeah, jelly donut, yeah, ha, 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 and, pi yeah. So, if you're watching this video of mine, you've probably already watched Full Metal Jacket. So, I'm not worried about spoiling anything for you at all. And even if I were to, even if you haven't seen the movie already, I still really couldn't spoil it for you. There's nothing to spoil. In my opinion. That's this, this movie, it's not about like, that's the thing with Stanley Kubrick. There is no way to spoil his movies. I could tell you the end of the movie with The Shining. If you've not seen the whole movie, if you haven't watched it ever, I could tell you the end of The Shining and that would not spoil anything. You'd still be left with all kinds of questions. You'd be like, what? That's what, that's, that's how it ends. Yeah, that's how it ends. And then the person that you're talking to would be like, I gotta watch this. You know, it would just make you want to watch it. It wouldn't spoil it. It would make you want to watch it. Um, same thing with this one. The end of Full Metal Jacket. It's like, really? That's how it ends? Yep. Yep. You know, and why does it end that way? I don't know. Stanley Kubrick's dead. We can't ask him. Gustav Hasvert is dead, too. And, oh, th there was some drama, and I'll get into that later. <sighs> okay, so. So we know. Okay, if... If we, if, if we, if you're here, you've seen the movie probably, and you know what happens. You don't know why it happens, but you know what happens in the movie. Okay, so let me, let me move on to, uh, wait, let me, let me just scroll down here. Filming, themes. Okay, you can, you can read this on your own. Critical reception. Uh huh. Accolades. Was there anything juicy down here? In differences, but there you go. That's what I was looking for. The differences between the novel and the screenplay. Go ahead and read through this. That's your, that's your assignment. Go ahead and read through this. Um, that's what I was beginning to say, and then I got kind of tangented, sidetracked. Uh, very similar to The Shining, uh, where Stanley Kubrick does not, he's, The, the Shining, the movie is not faithful to Stephen King's novel. No, that's why Stephen King was so pissed. Uh, same thing here. Stanley did it again. This is his next movie, After the Shining. And he did it again. He pissed off uh, the author of The Short Timers. Gustav Hasford. He didn't, you know, for some reason these authors think that, that they're, that, you know, how dare somebody like Stanley Kubrick or whatever, like, mess around with the plot or the whatever of their novel. Dude. Dude. Why do you... Ugh. Just like I said in one of my other videos, I think in my viewer mail video, where I was like, maybe Stephen King is a little overrated. Maybe. Maybe this Gustav Hasbro dude is, you know, not as... not He wasn't as hot as he thought he was. I don't know. But he did it again. What he did with Stephen King, 
he did with Gustav Hasford, and there's a controversy. Go ahead and read about it here. Um, Gustav Hasford was like pissed. He was totally pissed about it. Um, I mean, if I were if I were him, would I be pissed too? I don't know. I don't know. He maybe he isn't understanding like his role in the whole thing. I don't know. Like with Stanley Kubrick, it's almost like he like deliberately chooses bad uh, novels to adapt into movies or he chose rather bad novels or novels with like serious problems with their structure and the narrator and like where the author was coming from and he decided to make that into a movie like you see this is the this I, like I said this is the genius of Stanley Kubrick he takes like a half-ass novel you know, story by whatever author, and he turns it into a movie, and he injects it with, like, so many things for you to question and think about and wonder about and and analyze. It's like, but would you have ever analyzed as much if you just read the Shining novel? No. Would you... Uh, no, because that, with the Shining, the Stephen King, and apparently with this Hasbard dude... Like, they've already made their minds up about everything. They think that, that their word is the last word and that's it regarding these things that they're writing about. No, it's not. Whatever you're, whatever you're reading in a novel, whether it's a recent one or whether it's like from a century ago or however long ago, when you're reading a story that somebody wrote, that's that person's opinion about stuff about life, about people, about whatever situation they're writing about, historical situation, um, you know, political, economic, whatever. Like, that's that author's opinion. Is that, is that author right? Um, maybe not. Maybe they are. Maybe they have a good point with some shit. And with other shit, it's like, mm, nah. You know, the author is not God. They're not. You get to, you get to disagree with them. You get to enjoy the book. If, you know, if you're into the reading or whatever, you get to enjoy them in the novel and also disagree with the author both at the same time. You can do that. It's okay. <laughs> that's, that's the thing I don't understand about people. If they're fans of somebody, like they, they basically, you know, um, uh, author, a uh, movie director, a show, um, uh, music, a musician or, or, you know, recording artist or whatever you call it, or they, they, like they, excuse me, I'm stuttering. Um, <clears throat> they like to regard that person as kind of a deity, a divinity. They're not, they're absolutely not. They're just, they're just an artist. Art is a job, just like any other job. All right. Creating art is a job, just like any other job. They might as well be a plumber, a carpenter, a mechanic, a cook, uh, you know, a barber, a hairstylist, a seamstress, any of the other trades. All right. They, they, these people really need to get their heads out of their asses. But let me move on. Let me go on to my next, um, link here. Okay. So, oh, this is what I wanted to. Okay. So I, I have always had the question, what the hell is a full metal jacket? Uh, oof. I know I've looked it up before, but like it never stuck. I never really memorized the answer. So what's a full metal jacket? Hold up. Here it is. What is full metal jacket? A full metal jacket, FMJ, is a bullet that has a soft core, usually with lead, and is encased in a harder alloy metal such as copper nickel or gilding metal. The purpose of these rounds is to hold their trajectory, and they have greater penetration against soft tissue. These rounds are ideal for target shooting since they, oh my, since they do not expand much when hitting their target. The downside to FMJ in self-defense is the risk of unintended impact further down the range. Penetration could hit an innocent bystander in a parking lot or penetrate through a wall, hitting a loved one in the middle of the night. You can use FMJ ammo for self-defense, but you must remember the golden rule. Know what's between you and your intended target, and what's beyond your target. In other words, downrange. Huh. 
Well, that's interesting. I don't know anything about weapons, ammunition. No, I don't know anything about that. Not just because I'm a girl. There's plenty of women who know plenty about this kind of thing. I'm not one of them. I never learned. I, I wish I had. Honestly, I wish I did know about this kind of thing now at this point in my life as, as a grown up. Um, I was wronged. I, I, I was, I was gypped. I, I needed an education in this. I think, I think everybody should know about this stuff and learn about it. And, you know, why not? Why not? Um, it's good to know about stuff like this. Uh, again, it's a bullet that has a soft core. This is the most important part for me. That has a soft core, usually with lead, and is encased in a harder alloy metal. So, are the, you know, the, the titular full metal jackets of the movie are, are, is this, this kind of, um, when they say full metal jacket, and that is famously quoted by, uh, Private Pyle before he does his big scene, right, in the bathroom. Um, 762 full, full metal jacket, right? Full metal jacket. A bullet that has a soft core, usually with lead, and is encased in a harder alloy metal, such as copper nickel or gilding metal. So it's got a soft core with a hard shell. All right. Again, I don't know anything about that might be common with regard to bullets. I don't know. I have no idea. But maybe it's describing these guys. On the inside, they're soft. They're not you know, they're, they're, they're mushy on the inside, right? And, and malleable. On the outside, they put on these airs that they're rough and tough and, you know, invincible, indestructible, but they're not. And is that part of their training by Gunnery Sergeant Hartman? Or is that part of their training as like good old American boys? I don't know. I don't know. Stanley is giving us a lot to think about in this movie. And just, and by the way, Full Metal Jacket, that's not the name of the novel that Gustav, that allegedly, well, not allegedly, but yeah, that the movie is based on. The name of the novel is The Short Timers. So, like, he went even further with this one. With The Shining, at least he kept the name of the novel. The original name of the novel by Stephen King. With this one, no. He said, F forget this, short timers. We're naming it Full Metal Jacket. There you go. <laughs> That's, that says something. And he named it Full Metal Jacket. What's a Full Metal Jacket? Well, you know, props to this person. I guess this is the one who, who wrote this. Uh, American g Gunner. Oh no, Muddy Bay Marine. That's, that's the, I'll, I'll leave a, leave a link if you want to explore this person's other writings this is all you know this is just from a google search so i don't know what else is going on in, on this web page i just looked for full metal jacket and that's what i found and i said that's perfect okay let's let's keep it moving now this what the hell is this oh my god toenail fungus advertising good lord anyway i found two cute articles one from task and purpose oh military okay so it's a military kind of website and then the other one I found is IndieWire. So the first one is 10 things you never realized about Full Metal Jacket when it comes to pop culture allure and romanticized brutality. Stanley Kubrick's Full Metal Jacket is arguably the most influential of... dot dot dot. Okay, cool. Uh, that was This was published in 2014. The next one from IndieWire was published in 2012. Five things you might not know about Stanley Kubrick's Full Metal Jacket. Five things you might not know about... Okay, they just say the same thing again. So I'll, I'll read through these quickly, right? Try not to take up too much of your time. So here is the famous scene, right? I don't know who these guys are here. They're not main characters. Uh, here's Sergeant Hartman. Just... My God. And oh, oh, this is the jelly donut scene. Okay, cool. And I have asked veterans of like different wars, like what's a full metal jacket? They couldn't tell me. They didn't know. So thank goodness for this year, right? Anyway, 10 things. When it comes to pop culture, allure, and romanticized brutality, Stanley Kubrick's full metal jacket is arguably the most influential of all. 
Vietnam War movies. Arlie Ermey's iconic portrayal of the sadistic gunnery sergeant Hartman has served as a de facto recruiting mechanism for the Marines since the film's release in 1987. Really? I remember watching the same VHS copy of Full Metal Jacket about a hundred times before I enlisted as a Marine combat correspondent, choosing the same military specialty as Private Joker. During the ten years I served in the corps, I was... It was a rare occasion to find a Marine who didn't love the film. Yeah, I've had the same experience, too. When I show it to people who are veterans who have, you know, been in the Marines or whatever branch of the military, they they all seem to have um, some kind of an affection for this movie. So that this is very true here. Um, despite FMJ's widespread popularity, there is a crap ton of behind-the-scenes drama and literary awesomeness from the original novel that gets missed if you've never looked into the film's backstory. Consider the list... I'm sorry. Consider this list the enthralling special features bonus DVD you never saw. Right. Okay, look at the cover of this. The short timers Gustav Hasford. Okay, cool. The book is better. Really, dude? Okay, I'm going to have to take issue with this. I doubt it. I, that's my opinion. I haven't read the thing. I've read like an excerpt from it, but, mm, no. I, I just don't think, I, I doubt it. I doubt it. He, okay, Hasver drew from his experience in Vietnam. All right. <sighs> what I say about unreliable narrators. So, Hasford, is he gonna make himself look bad in his, in his book? Probably not. Probably not. Would you? Moving on. Uh, the hell? Oh, two. Civilian correspondent Michael Herr shared a screenwriter credit with Hasbert, and Kubrick dispatches his Herr's memoir about his time as a civilian correspondent for Esquire from 1967 to 69. Herr's book is a masterpiece of literary nonfiction, while the vast majority of the dialogue in FMJ is taken straight from Hasford's book. The Psycho Door Gunner's darkly comic dialogue is pulled from dispatches, which you may or may not find disturbing in light of the fact that hers book is non-fiction. Oh my. Okay, that's interesting. There is a Psycho Door Gunner, this guy, um, there's a Psycho Door Gunner scene in both dis dispatches and the short timers. Noticing this, I briefly wondered if Hasford, oh, well, that's, here's some tea. Noticing this, I briefly wondered if Hasford might have borrowed, quote-unquote borrowed, from hers book, or if there was just a lot of psycho door gunners on marine helicopters in Vietnam. I lean toward the latter, Be possibly since the scene's similarities are negligible and the differences distinct. Hasford's gunner, for example, wears a Hawaiian sports shirt and smokes weed while eagerly wasting Vietnamese farmers in the hamlet below. Hmm. Okay. All right. Hmm. Okay. Number four, Hasford wrote a sequel to the short timers called The Phantom Blooper. In The Phantom Blooper, Joker spends a year as a POW in a Viet Cong village and eventually comes to sympathize with his Vietnamese captors. Yeah, that's called Stockholm Syndrome. Uh, after he is rescued, he turns against the war and his government. Oh, after he's rescued? Really? Because like Joker, you know, in the movie, joke, maybe it's not the same as the book. I told you Stanley did a number on him. Um, in the movie, they make it look like Joker is against the war right away with that peace sign on the helmet, as you can see here. Okay, uh, sympathize with his Vietnamese. After he is rescued, he turns again. Okay, Blooper was supposed to be book two of a trilogy, but Hasford died a few years after publishing it. Okay, number five, the peace symbol born to kill scene is derived from a short story Hasford wrote in community college after the war. The short is called, Is That You, John Wayne? Is This Me? Hmm. Okay. Cool. 
and he's got this row of bullets also in in this on this i don't know what this is called this band on the helmet all right gustav gustav hasford called arlie ermy a fucking pogue lifer oh dear Kubrick hired Ermi as a military technical advisor on FMJ. Ermi's background as a marine drill instructor caught Kubrick's attention, and the director recast Ermi in the iconic role of gunnery Sergeant Hartman. Hasford, who had campaigned to have his friend Dale Dye be the film's technical advisor, decried Ermi as a shill for the Marine Corps' pro-war propaganda machine. Hasford had a well-known mean streak that often manifested itself in letters he wrote to Kubrick, or others he felt had wronged him. Okay. All right. This is interesting. Is this not, is this not tea? This is tea. This is tea. This is my rifle. This is, oh my God. Uh, Kubrick kind of tried to screw Hasford out of a screenwriting credit and a lot of money, this abridged letter Hasford wrote to his friend Grover Lewis in 1985 explains. You can read this on your own. At this point, I do not really trust this Hasford person. Maybe I'm wrong, but he looks like kind of an unreliable narrator in real life and in his books. So let's, let's keep it moving. Number eight, Hasford won his battle with Kubrick. Okay, cool. Um, all right. Uh, Hasford's friends kept telling him he was in over his head, tangling with one of America's most beloved filmmakers and his Hollywood backers, but Hasford never flinched during his year-long battle. Okay, all right. Number nine, FMJ was filmed in England. Okay, cool. Uh, number ten, the type of upward uh, point of view shot is one of Kubrick's visual calling cards. He uses it in the second half of the film when the Lust Hog Squad survivors are standing over their dead bros, saying a few words. Also, look for it in The Shining, A Clockwork Orange, and others. And if you're a Quentin Tarantino fan, who isn't, right? Definitely watch this mashup, showing Tarantino's affinity for the same type of from-below shot. Bonus, one-point perspective is another Kubrick signature. Well, uh, captured brilliantly in this mashup from Kogonada, on Vimeo. Okay. Bonus fact. Writing for LA Weekly after his friend's death from diabetes in 1994, Grover Lewis found this gem of a Gus story from Steve Bernie Bernson. Okay. You can, you can go ahead and read this in your own time. This is really interesting about the point of view shot and like the one point perspective thing. So, something well since i'm an art history person the fact that if 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 stanley kubrick is really into one point perspective is another it says here is another kubrick signature captured brilliantly in this okay um that's interesting that what is he doing there why is he doing that is he trying to like do you know uh is that a symbol in its own right for something? I don't know. I can only speculate, I guess. Here's the... I'm, I'm going to try and keep this moving along quickly because last time it was a two-hour video. Woo! I did a lot with, with my viewer mail video and I need to do a part two for that one. I know. I know. And I will. Uh, five things you might not know about Stanley Kubrick's full metal jacket. Okay. Oh, I'm going to just skip over this intro because you can do that on your own if you want to. Uh, again, they keep calling in both articles, or is it this one and the uh, Wikipedia? I don't know. They keep calling the drill sergeant sadistic. <sighs> According to the people that I've spoken to who have served in the military and who are veterans, like, yeah, he's mean, but it's not because he doesn't like you. He yells, he cusses, he gives orders because that's his job. It's not because he has anything personal against you. That I, I don't understand. Like, why is everybody calling him sadistic? Are ballet teachers sadistic? You know? Or like coaches for, I don't know, football or whatever other sport or athletic pursuit. Are those people sadistic? Because like, 
yeah, athletes, athletes get pushed to work harder and harder and harder and even to the point of injury, like all the time. Are those people sadistic? I, th I would like to think maybe somebody like Sergeant Hartman is the least sadistic. He's trying to, he's doing a job. He's trying to prepare these people to you try, try to make sure that they survive in an environment like Vietnam. That's not sadistic. He's actually trying to do the, do something good. But that's just my perspective. Anyway, let's, let's, let's go. Did I miss anything? We're like, really? the hell oh lord matthew modine the film star put out a new ipad app today that sees the actor narrate the photos and journals he kept at kubrick's encouragement throughout the making of the movie well goddamn to, oh oh now you know about that if you're interested this is from 2012 okay so that's that, 10 years ago my god okay like exactly almost exactly august 2012 so almost exactly 10 years ago wow i'm glad i like saw that and picked up on it hmm uh profane profound and endlessly influential on war movies to come uh all right the film quite unlike anything else that kubrick ever made follows a group of aspiring u.s marines aspiring okay cool as they are pushed through basic training by their, again, sadistic drill sergeant and shipped out to Vietnam. Full of unforgettable sequences and typically pitch-perfect filmmaking, it's somehow less talked about than some of Kubrick's pictures, but certainly remains one of his most powerful and brilliant films. I, I agree. I agree. Okay, number one. The film began from the seeds of a Holocaust movie that Kubrick wanted to make. Kubrick had already made one of the all-time great war movies, and I need to watch this. I still haven't watched all of his movies, uh, war movies with Paths of Glory. And indeed, when he first started thinking about a new project after The Shining, the director wasn't intending to make a film in the same genre as the earlier Kirk Douglas starer. As far back as 1976, Kubrick was starting to think about a Holocaust film, attempting to get Nobel Prize winning Jewish American author Isaac Bashevis singer enemies a love story to write a script for him it was in this context shortly before the release of the shining that kubrick contacted michael Herr, who had been a war correspondent for esquire magazine in vietnam and written the acclaimed memoir memoir of his time there 1977's dispatches kubrick wanted Herr's opinion on whether an adaptation of historian raoul Hilberg's seminal The Destruction of the European Jews could work, but talk soon turned to Vietnam. The pair came across Gustav Hasford's novel The Short Timers and decided to adapt that instead, with Hasford working on the screenplay along with them. After Full Metal Jacket, however, the Holocaust still lingered in Kubrick's mind, and in the early 1990s the director came very close to making Aryan Papers, an adaptation of Louis Begley's wartime lies about a young Polish Jewish woman and her nephew who take up identities as Catholics to avoid persecution by the Nazis. Kubrick cast Jurassic Park actor Joseph Mazzello as the boy, with Dutch actress, actress Johanna Terstiga, uh, the van, ooh, the vanishing, as the aunt, but scrapped the project after the release of Steven Spielberg's Schindler's List. Wow, this is interesting. Oh my goodness, who knew? I didn't know any of this. Wow, okay, moving on. Co-writer Gustav Hasford didn't attend the Oscars, partly because he'd fallen out with Kubrick, and partly because he was being prosecuted for stealing a library books. I'll let you read this on your own. But again, um... This this Hasford uh, character, he's he's he sounds like one real sour pickle. You know what I mean? Like I I don't know. He doesn't seem like an easy person to be friends with. Um, and I don't know what to think because I wasn't there. 
But again, I told you already what I think maybe was going on, but I, I, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna elaborate on that. So that's number two. Number three, Anthony Michael Hall. Oh, well, uh, Anthony Michael Hall was the original choice to play Joker, while Kubrick considered casting deliverance rapist Bill McKinney as the drill sergeant. <laughs> really? That would have been horrifying. Um, and I guess that's not what he was going for. This is not a horror movie. And like the, the sound of that, Anthony Michael Hall as Joker and the deliverance rapist as the drill sergeant, that sounds just terrifying. And I don't think it would have been the same movie. But the cast of Full Metal Jacket didn't quite contain any future A-listers, but a number of the major actors, Matthew Modine, Adam Baldwin, Arliss Howard, Vincent D'Onofrio, who put on 70 pounds for the role, more weight than Robert De Niro did for Raging Bull, and which took him nine months to lose, went on to long careers elsewhere. But as ever, the cast could have looked quite different. The Breakfast Club star, Anthony Michael Hall, was in fact Kubrick's first choice to play the lead role of Private Joker, but after nearly eight months of negotiations, dropped out. Well. Hmm. I, I don't think that would have been a good choice. I think he looked too young at the time for this part. So Modine was probably a much better choice. Okay, I'm back. I had to take a short break. Anyway, what was I saying? Yeah, it would have been a, uh, Anthony Michael Hall would not have been a good choice for Joker because he looked too young. Um, and that's not, I don't think that's what you wanted or what would have been appropriate for this movie. Um, <clears throat> says here all the other people who were like up for the role. Val Kilmer. Okay. Um, <laughs> well, yeah, go ahead and read through this. This is juicy. Uh, Bruce Willis. No way in hell that would have worked Kubrick had uh, expressed interest in hiring, hiring Bill McKinney from <clears throat> Deliverance uh, I don't know Kubrick was afraid of Bill McKinney. <clears throat> okay. <laughs> I find that hard to believe, but whatever. I guess I'll just take their word for it. Arlie Ermey, who played Gunnery Sergeant Hartman, was originally only a consultant on the film, but pursued the part and was allowed to ad-lib. I, I can see him being impressed by Ermey. Ermey, like... Is a very commanding presence in this movie, and mm -hmm. I can't imagine the movie with any other actors than what it has. Like I think they did a great job eventually. Um, you know, in this in this in this movie, they did a great job casting the people who ended up actually playing these roles. But whatever. So go ahead and read that in your own time. Arlie Ermey was, he was, and apparently, what did we read in the other one? That Gustav Hasford, Hasford, um, like had an issue with Ermey, uh, getting the part because he thought of Ermey as a shill for the Marines. Okay, whatever. And number five, the film was the unlikely inspiration for two hit singles. Oh, okay. Um, <clears throat> Nancy Sinatra and the Rolling Stones. Well, Kubrick had also intended to use a score of Japanese drum compositions, but the director was played a synth composition by his daughter, Vivian, who was also on set making a documentary, as she did for The Shining, although it was never completed. She can also be seen in a cameo as a news camera woman at the mass grave. Oh. Oh, 
oh, she, he, he elected to get her to write the whole score of the film under the pseudonym Abigail Mead. Okay. Ah, uh, Full Metal Jacket, I want to be your drill instructor. Uh, credit, oh, credited to Abigail Mead and the mysterious Nigel Goulding. Oh, it's samples of Arlie Ermey's drill chants from the film in an almost hip-hop style. Oh, for God's sake, this is all interesting. This is really, really, really interesting. Okay, all right, cool. So, that's it for five. Yeah, we did ten, and then we did five things. All right, and then we go to this Wikipedia page, The Short Timers. You go ahead and you read this plot summary, and you will see how it differs from the movie, Full Metal Jacket. The names are changed. As you can see, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Private Pyle's name in the in the book is Leonard Pratt. Um, in the movie, it's I think it's Leonard Lawrence. Um, Joker. What what's J Joker? Okay, James Davis. They keep they keep the same name, but they don't. I don't think do do they. Do they ever say Joker's real name out loud in the movie? Or they just call him Joker the whole time? Maybe you can see, like, on his name tag or whatever. I don't know. But go ahead and read this. This is informative. For And it's a, the, the, somebody, this, I think this person said, like, his number one thing was, um, in the 10 things article, the book is better. Okay, cool. The book is better. This is like a plot synopsis of the book. I don't know if it's better. It's darker. It's more horrifying, if that's what they mean. Um, the grunts portion, it's a little bit, mm, yeah, it's, it's a little bit too much. And the cowboy character, you, you, mm. So, there's a huge difference, right? Read this. Grunts. Um, Joker kills cowboy. Okay. In that last part of the movie. Joker, if it were true to the novel, it would be Joker killing cowboy and then leading the rest of the men away. Yeah, that's not what happened in the movie. Cowboy's the one who apparently goes crazy, right? In, in the book. In the movie? No. No. An animal mother threatens cowboy's life? No. For some reason, that got switched around. I don't know why. I can't know why. But Stanley Kubrick, I'm sure he has his reasons. He's trying to put forward something. He's trying to show you something about something, teach you something about something in the movie, right? Now that you see that there's a novel and there's a difference, Wow. Okay, and then last but not, well, not last, but, but almost last, but not least, Gustav Hasford. This guy's weird. I don't know what to think of him. Um, go ahead and take a look at his Wikipedia page. He stole a bunch of books from libraries. And I, I'm not saying that makes him a bad person, but I am saying that's real suspicious. Again, shout out to Bailey Sarian. It, this is very, very, very suspicious. Like, he was wanted for grand theft, um, for borrowing 98 books from the Sacramento, California Public Library and never returning them. Um, he was charged with the theft, uh, and they found nearly 10,000 library books in his rented storage locker. At that time, he had 87 overdue books and five years of the Civil War Times Magazine issues, checked out from the Cal Poly SLO library. The materials were valued at over $20,000. Like, why? Why? Why would you do that? Um, yeah, and that happens more often than you would, you would, um, maybe expect in libraries. Like, people steal books, especially if they're valuable books. Um, 
and I'm not even talking about like people who are just members of the library. I'm talking about like people who work there. Like if there's a, if there's a popular book or if there's a book for some reason that it's considered rare or expensive for whatever reason, they'll, yeah, the staff in the library will just steal it. And like nobody knows who did it. Nobody knows how it happened. That book just disappeared and never to be seen again. So, but this, this guy wasn't working at the library as far as I can tell. <sighs> anyway, so I don't know what, what was going on with this guy. I have a feeling that Stanley Kubrick just didn't like him. That's my feeling. And again, you can see why they, I think this guy, the, the lower half of his face in this picture, at least, looks way too, this could easily be Matthew Modine. You could very easily mistake this picture for being a picture of Matthew Modine um, when he was younger. Boo. Something's going on. Like I said, I think maybe Kubrick just didn't like this guy. And why do I feel that way? I Because he butchered his novel. He, I don't, I think that Stanley Kubrick maybe didn't like Stanley, I'm sorry. I think that Stanley Kubrick also didn't like Stephen King. That's why, that's maybe one of his motivations for picking that novel and then just turning it inside out and turning everything upside down in the Shining novel and when he adapted it to the, to the film version. It's, I think, who was it? One of my commenters, one of you guys, right? From the viewer mail video. Um, somebody, who, who was it? Ooh, I can't remember. But one of you said, like, if you just change the names of the characters in the Shining movie, it, it ceases bearing any resemblance to the novel whatsoever. You're right. You're right. That might also be the case with this year. Like, if they just changed, like, really changed. He already tried changing, you know, um, Private, po Private Pile, Gomer Pile. Like, his name in the book is Leonard Pratt. In the movie, it's Leonard Lawrence. Like, what's up with that? I don't know. Something about that character. Maybe Stanley Kubrick is trying to let you know, like, focus on that character much harder than, than you think you should. Like, that's, that's the Vincent D'Onofrio's character, Private Pyle, in the movie. Like, he makes a big impact. The character, like, that, that, that character leaves, uh, uh, ooh, that that leaves a mark when you see that scene. Watch it all the way through. But I think Kubrick's saying, no, watch it even closer. And watch that character throughout their whole time in the movie. Watch that uh, the Private Pile character even closer. Because he's not... It's, it's, there's a lot going on with that character. And it's not even just that character. It's the way that that character is viewed by our trusty, unreliable narrator, Private Joker, because we're seeing Private Pyle through the lens of Joker's eyes. Speaking of lenses, Gustav Hasford, I, I did a Google search of this guy last night. There's like a good number of pictures of him, like in the Google images. In none of them is he wearing glasses. Like the character, I don't know if in the book it says that the um, Joker character, what's his real name, James Davis, um, here, here it is, in, in the, in, I don't know if in the book he's um, described as wearing glasses, he might very well be, I don't know, but if it's based on him, if he's basing the Joker character on himself, Gustav Hasford, Hasford doesn't wear glasses, didn't wear glasses, so like, Joker, has these glasses and another character. Where is he? Um, cast. Here it is. Ah, ha, 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 ha. Arliss Howard, uh, Private Sergeant Cowboy Evans. Um, and him and him and Joker were together on Paris Island. He also wears glasses. Okay. I'm going to get into that when I get into discussing this movie. But yeah, Joker wears glasses. Cowboy wears glasses in the, you know, again, if Joker is based on Hasford, Hasford does not wear glasses. What's going on with those glasses? They're important. They're very important. 
um, just sort of as a little preview or a little um, teaser. When Cowboy dies, he dies with his glasses off. Something to think about. Anyway, Private Joker. Like I said, I'm starting to really not like this guy. I, I, I'm, I, I kind of am starting to like, um, Sergeant Hartman more and more and more and more. And liking Joker less and less and less and less. Because, I don't know, something's going on. Like my brain, uh, the wheels are turning. So, you guys, I have been talking for 55 minutes, almost 56 minutes, about this intro to this movie that I'm going to do analysis on this movie in my own special way. I'm going to talk it through. All right. So, I hope you've enjoyed this. I hope you've had at least a little bit of fun. I will leave all of these links to these pages that I've used and covered for this intro um, in the description of the video. All right. Let me zoom in on this. Look at, look at, look at these glasses. And it's not just that he's wearing glasses, it's that they're gold rimmed. So much going on. So much going on. I wouldn't expect anything less from Stanley. But like I said, um, I've been talking for almost an hour. Uh, and next time, I don't know how I'm going to do this. Just like Kill Bill, I don't know how I'm going to approach this. I don't know if I'm, Gonna, I mean, with like The Shining, I'm doing like three minute segments. I don't know if I'm gonna do that with Full Metal Jacket or with Kill Bill. Or should I just like zero in on one symbol or on one idea and like make a movie about that and then, you know, next time new idea, next idea, make a, make, make a movie. No, not, not a movie, a video about the idea that I want to talk about or the symbol that I want to talk about or sheesh i don't know i don't know i will figure it out just like i will with the um with the with with kill bill and i don't know if i'm going to do any more exorcist videos i think i do have some more to say about the exorcist but i need to like look at it again because you miss a lot of stuff like i'm not the kind who takes notes i am just not i'm not going to waste my time that way but um Everything is like from my brain, from my in from from my head. Whether it's it's not organized, it's not cute, but it's the way I do things. So anyway, like I said, I've been talking for almost an hour, almost an hour. Let me click on this. Oh, yeah. Is this gonna be my thumbnail? Probably not. Probably gonna find a picture of Animal Mother or something. Um, but you guys, thank you uh, once again. Uh, for, if you are subscribed, thank you for subscribing. I appreciate it so much. Hopefully I can get to a hundred subscribers pretty soon. Maybe when I get to a hundred subscribers, I'll do a giveaway. Like I originally tried to do when I first started this channel and nobody was watching. So like nobody gave a shit. So, you know, maybe I'll do when I get to a hundred subscribers, that original giveaway, my little shining paraphernalia and, uh, we'll see. But, um, I think I might make another video later this week, maybe another coffee break video or or something like that, just to chat about stuff in general, or maybe an art talk, maybe an art crimes video. I don't know. We'll see. Maybe another shining video. Who the hell knows? It's hot in Southern California. Right now, it is hotter than, I won't even say what, um... I've been, I've been <laughs> having trouble dealing, having trouble dealing with, uh, with these high temperatures and everything. Oof, it's too much. Maybe that's another reason why I'm so slow to get videos done. Um, but again, all 71 of you, thank you for subscribing. So returning viewers, thank you for returning. New viewers, thank you for being new and taking a chance and clicking on these videos and watching them. Um, I hope you like them. If you don't, let me know. Hit the dislike button and Leave a comment letting me know what I did wrong, what I could have done better. Uh, and again, don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, share if you know somebody who would maybe like this stuff. And until next time, until my next video about whatever, uh, I'll figure something out. I'll find another reason to talk at you yet again. 
And until next time, I'm going to go ahead and bid you bye-bye. So, bye-bye, everybody. <laughs>